This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. It is May of 1959, Hanoi, North Vietnam. Critical meeting among the leadership at the time, the Vietnamese Communist Party and the Vietnamese, the, the North Vietnam Army coming together to look to the future, influenced by events in the Cold War. This moment begins the tale of the long reckoning, a new book from George Black, a story of war, peace, and redemption. This is Vietnam. It's the Vietnam War. It was not available for those of us old enough to have lived this period as young men, watching it from university, then watching it from the East Coast of the United States during the anti-war movement, then watching it around the edges as the novels came out, as the Hollywood movies responded, as the story was told and retold. But to my knowledge, not told the way George Black has presented. George, a very good evening to you. Congratulations. May of 1959. Gathered together is Ho Chi Minh, the inspiring figure of the Vietnamese Communist Party, a Vin Nguyen Zep, the general responsible or given credit for or uh, generally accredited with the victory at Dien Bien Phu over the French colonial masters, in the early 1950s, who lived to the age of 102, dying in 2013. But most importantly, you reveal information that was perhaps available at the time, but I don't remember hearing this, George. A man named Lei Zan, head of the Vietnamese Communist Party in a rigorous and ideological fashion, and the general in charge of the army, Wen Chi Pen their identification now of the war going forward. What was the contest? What was the debate? And what was the decision? Good evening to you, George. Good evening, John. It's very nice to be with you. And thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, 1959, yes, major moment in history uh, for many, many different reasons. I would say the biggest of those reasons is the Sino-Soviet split. And really the... I would say even backtracking a little bit before 59, a series of, of misunderstandings by the United States that were born of events in the immediate post-World War II period. And I would single out a couple. One would be the McCarthy era and the removal of basically all of the China experts in the State Department, <clears throat> which, which gave rise to this illusion that the communist world was a great monolith and had a common purpose, common strategies. Um, they missed the significance of the Sino-Soviet split because they didn't understand China. Even before that, <clears throat> immediately post-World War II, you had a wave of uh, decolonization throughout the world. And it was generally accepted that this was an unstoppable force. Uh, the British were getting out of India, and the US at that point was faced with a choice. They could either say to the French, look, this is a force that's happening everywhere. It's an inevitable move of history after the war. Or they could say, we're so sorry for the French, our loyal allies, they were overrun by the Nazis. We'll throw them a bone, which is you know, not make a fuss about them keeping their colonies. And then once the French began to fight to keep uh, Southeast Asia, the United States then came in with military aid to the French to the point where they were giving 80% of, uh, of what France needed to fight the war. So that's the backdrop to 59. And then you get Cuba. And you get a debate between the Soviet Union and China about the pace at which uh, the revolutions in the world should proceed, with the Soviets being much more cautious, um, much more about consolidating victories, um, the Chinese being much more adventurous. And the split begins in Vietnam. And I think one of the great illusions about the war and one of the one of, I, I would say if there's a single symbol of how badly it was misunderstood, General Westmoreland, who commanded American forces in Vietnam, um, wrote a 400 page autobiography memoir. And there is not one single mention in 400 pages of the man who was actually running the Vietnamese war effort, Les Zuan, 
the Secretary General um, of, of the Vietnamese Workers' Party, later the Communist Party, which is like Sun Tzu's first law of war is know your enemy. And I don't think there was ever an appreciation really of who the enemy was, why they were fighting, what motivated their, their struggle. And, you know, they were Marxist-Leninists and Les Zuan was particularly hard line, but the dominant feature was it was a struggle for national independence. And it was an extremely militant and very uncompromising struggle for national independence. And Marxism was a tool they used and a philosophy that they believed in to varying degrees. But uh, then when Cuba, when the Cuban revolution happened in January of 59, it vindicated a lot of what Le Zuan was arguing for. He was basically saying, the South has been abandoned since the country was partitioned in 1954 by the Geneva Peace Agreements. And the Southern revolutionaries are being thrown to the wolves. The United States are backing a very hardline military regime. Uh, he had actually grown up himself in the area immediately below the demilitarized zone, which is where a lot of the long reckoning is set in the province of Quang Tri. And he had been a commander of Southern forces and he saw them being abandoned. And he said, look, the Americans are likely to come in at some point we should hit the Southern army while it's still weak. And during that period from 59 through to 63, um, he saw the first big defeats of the South Vietnamese army by the Viet Cong in 1963 as a sort of vindication of what he was saying. The Americans are not there, we've got to preempt it. And Ho Chi Minh and General Zap, the, the mastermind of the victory at Dien Bien Phu, we're saying, no, we don't want to provoke an intervention by the Americans. We're too weak. We're still recovering from the French war. So that was the essence of the split. And it's sometimes described as, you know, Les Zuan was pro-Chinese and Ho Chi Minh was pro-Soviet. It's not quite that simple because um, the reality of how they conducted the war was that they managed to get aid from both of the communist powers without ever sacrificing their independence of how they defined the strategy. They were brilliant at playing the two superpowers off against each other or keeping both happy at the same time and avoiding taking sides. And I think that's a big part of why they won. The tool that, that the Hanoi decision makers uh, uh, launch is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah. Uh, which you've described as a ladder starting in North Vietnam, coming through Laos, and then entering into Vietnam in what is essentially I Corps, which is where all the killing was, the killing zone of I Corps, from the DMZ to Da Nang. Yeah. That construction was artfully done uh, and overwhelmingly successful. At the time, did the Americans know that this was being built before the decision was to deploy the Marines in 65? Did they know about the? the Ho Chi Minh Trail be in that period between 59 and 65? Yes, they did. Um, it was very, very rudimentary in the early days. And the idea in the first place was to cross the demilitarized zone, to come in from the north into the south directly. <clears throat> now, the demilitarized zone happened to be at the very, very narrowest point of this long, skinny country. It's only about 35 miles wide from the Lao border to the ocean at that point, which meant it was very particularly easy for the French to defend. And one of the great disputes in the Geneva talks in 1954 is where the boundary line should be drawn. And in the end, in part because the Soviets pressed Ho Chi Minh to be more conciliatory, he wanted the line to be drawn much farther south, which would have given the North control of the city of Da Nang with its seaport and the only east-west highway that cut across the country, which became very famous to the Marines who fought there, Route 9. It ran parallel and immediately south of the DMZ. But the settlement at Geneva gave the South control of that, and it meant that the French and then the South Vietnamese government of the Republic of Vietnam it was a much easier place to defend. They could station troops and patrols along Route 9. Uh, 
uh, they had a fairly narrow band of territory to defend. So in 62, and this was again really Le Zouan's idea, uh, they were supporting, the North was supporting the communist Patet Lao on the Lao side of the border. And they took a strategic part of the Lao portion of that road, Route 9, in 1961. And after that, Le Zouan said, we've got to drive this trail down through Laos and then find infiltration points through the very high mountains that separate the two countries, the Trongtong yeah. Mountains. The book is The Long Reckoning. George Black is the author, a story of war, peace, and redemption in Vietnam. The Ho Chi Minh Trail built painstakingly from North Vietnam into South Vietnam through Laos. It is 1965, and the South Vietnamese have not been successful in fending off either the Viet Cong or what is this, what is understood as to be North Vietnamese troops crossing or somehow entering into Vietnam south of the DMZ. A decision is made to guard the airfield at Da Nang, a large seaport. The Marines are dispatched, an expeditionary force, beginning the American combat troop phase of the war. At the same time, Operation Ranch Hand, which was endorsed by Jack Kennedy, is now enhanced with an understanding by the president, LBJ, and his consultants, his generals, that the way to fight this war is to defeat the supplies that are flowing into the South. And that means the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that means, uh, George, I'm not actually sure whose idea it was to destroy the uh, the triple canopy jungle. Was there one person taking credit for that concept? No, it wasn't. It was really an extension of uh, a, a belief in technologies of various kinds, which I think was shared pretty much throughout the, really the, I, I was gonna say the administrations in the United States, but really at a popular cultural level, you know, people after World War II were very enamored of the idea that technology was the future, it could solve all our problems. And these chemicals that were used to defoliate the Vietnamese jungles and mangrove forests, and at the same time to kill and destroy food crops that were supposedly supporting the enemy. Um, it was a natural extension of what was being done. You know, it was keeping American lawns green and golf courses. It was it was killing weeds on farm fields. And, you know, these were regarded as miracle chemicals. So extending them to Vietnam in conjunction with heavy bombing, um, those were really technological responses to the geography and topography of Vietnam and the Ho Chi Minh Trail in particular, um, <clears throat> which always gave the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong an advantage because they knew the terrain. They knew it very well. It was very difficult terrain. You had forests that gave a lot of cover to troops. You had mountains that were usually, you know, wreathed in cloud and heavy rain which produced this very thick forest canopy, but also posed a lot of difficulties for combat troops. It was very a very unpleasant and very frightening place to fight. And it also impeded air operations because a lot of the time you couldn't see the ground. So with the Ho Chi Minh Trail, <clears throat> excuse me, with Ho Chi Minh Trail, which by 65 had been significantly expanded and was beginning to put its first tendrils, if you want to put it that way, through the mountains into the area immediately below the DMZ. And notably, one particular place that is a big part of my book and was legendary really among American military people, the Ashaw Valley, uh, which later became the site of Hamburger Hill. That was the first infiltration point south of the DMZ, and it became the North Vietnamese stronghold. So the philosophy of the bombing and of the herbicide campaign was cut the trail, block the movement of supplies and defoliate on both sides of the border. And Laos was a, a great secret of the war that Laos was also being sprayed at this time. Um, 
that was the way to hold back the enemy and defeat their advantages of terrain and geography by using technology. 2378-tetrochlorobenzo-p-dioxin. Dioxin is the critical word there. Yeah. It's called TCDD, uh, manufactured in the US. You mentioned Monsanto, you mentioned Dow Chemical. At that time, in using that against the canopy, had there been conversation about what it does to human beings? Did that research exist? <clears throat> yes, it did, um, in a preliminary way. Dow Chemical, above all, um, actually convened a meeting of executives from the various chemical companies. And they said, look, as a trace component of one of the two chemicals that was used in combination to create what became known as Agent Orange, um, there is a very minute trace element of dioxin, which is highly toxic. They identified one particular skin condition called chloracne as uh, a health effect of exposure to dioxin. But there was not enormous concern because the quantities uh, in the natural form of the production process were not that great. And it was only designed anyway to be used on the enemy and there was no great concern about their health. That will come to later perhaps was a great illusion because American troops were very much exposed to Agent Orange. But in the early days, and I think this is sincere, and I think this is a hard thing for a lot of veterans to accept because so many veterans are still uh, bitter about the Agent Orange experience. Hundreds of thousands of them have sickened. We have 30 uh, seconds here, George, please continue. Um, but the problem was the quantities and the intensity with which it became used. And when the Pentagon stepped up demand, which they did increasingly after 66, the production process went awry. It was supposed to be done under very strict heat controls. Those were abandoned. The dioxin magnified massively. And that's where the health problems really began seriously. The book is The Long Reckoning, a story of war, peace, and redemption. It covers the critical period of American combat, but before and after American combat, we meet our two protagonists. One, Manus Campbell of Bayonne, New Jersey, who joins the Marine Corps and signs up for three years, knowing he'll go to Vietnam. And the other, Charles Searcy of Athens, Georgia, who joins the army. And because of his uh, training and education, he steered in the intelligence corps. Both end up in Vietnam at roughly the same period. This is 67 to 68. Uh, George, Manus Campbell is keen on proving himself to his father. And uh, it's striking that Chuck Searcy, the same relationship with his father, he wants to demonstrate who he was. But I'll start with Manus Campbell. Did he understand when he signed up to the Marine Corps that he was going to be put into the killing zone of the I Corps? Did they, was that information available to them or were they just following orders? They were just following orders. I think Manus, knew about as much about Vietnam as most 19 year olds. And it's important to stress that age. I mean, these kids were too young to vote and they were seven years younger on average than the enlistees in World War II and draftees in World War II. Um, he was a working class, lower middle class, if you wanna say, um, Catholic kid from suburban New Jersey. Um, he had a very demanding, father who had a lot of uh, psychological difficulties, struggled with what we would basically now call bipolar disease, and uh, was very, very demanding, very critical, nothing was ever good enough for him. And Manus was a quiet kid, and his father basically forced him to this idea that he had to bulk up, he became a swim champion, and he wanted to please his father. And I think that you know, if you look at 18, 19 year old kids anywhere, their relationship with their father and how they define themselves is very fundamental. And he wanted to join the Marines because the Marines were the elite. They were where you became a hero. He had no idea where he was gonna be sent or which unit he was gonna be assigned to. And he was assigned to the 1st Battalion of the 4th Marines. And they were deployed during those years in 
essentially the worst combat zone in Vietnam at the worst possible time. And he had all of the worst possible experiences. Yes, from the DMZ to Da Nang. Now we go to a Goldwater supporter as a young man, Chuck Searcy from Athens, Georgia, uh, headed to the University of Georgia, but he enlists and is immediately taken up for his intelligence into the 519th Military Intelligence Battalion based uh, in Saigon. Did he have an understanding of the war he was going to, where 80% of the American combat troops I have from your reporting did not see the firefighting that right. Campbell would see? Did, did Chuck Searcy know that he wasn't going to be in a frontline unit and shot at? I think he knew that because he's, he sort of steered himself after boot camp, which he hated. I mean, boot camp is such a, a basic part of their experience. You know, it's, it, the memorable scenes in, in the movie Full Metal Jacket, the screaming drill sergeant who dehumanizes the, the recruits. You know, most 19-year-old boys don't want to go and kill another human being. I mean, they have to be turned into the parts in a machine that has that sole purpose. So they have to be taught to dehumanize the enemy, to refer to them by racist terms, to be told that they are godless communists. And that turns them into something they were not. And Chuck found that experience, even though he came from, you know, a conservative Georgia family in the years of segregation. He was a Barry Goldwater supporter. All of the Cersei boys always went into the military. But he was in the middle of his college education. He dropped out of college um, and went to military intelligence school. Uh, he had no taste for the idea of combat. He didn't want to be a combat hero like Manus Campbell. And so he found himself in Saigon. They arrived, the two of them, within a week of each other in June of 67. And that was an absolutely critical moment in the war in determining how both sides were now struggling with the dilemma that the war was a stalemate and the tactics on both sides had to change. Yes, let's look at the war that they arrive into in 1967. Uh, the Marines are I Corps. That's the northernmost part of the very narrow Vietnam up along the South China Sea coastline. The DMZ is at the top. And then there's Quang Tri and Tu Tien. Tu Tien, yeah. Yes. And Tu Tien is the one that has the, it's almost a stage set, George, the Asao Valley, where uh, Campbell is headed to the Asao Valley. All of the reporting. Late in the war, is headed to the Asao Valley. Why? Why was the Asao Valley so critical to both sides? It was particularly difficult terrain. It was a long, very, very narrow valley right up against the Lao border. One of the first uh, American advisors who was sent there, in fact, was Colin Powell in 63. Um, the local indigenous people, and somebody one day will write a great book about the indigenous people of Southeast Asia and the war, because they were absolutely critical to how it developed. And the indigenous people of the Asha Valley, the Katu, the Pako, the Taoi, they were very early on loyalists to the north. They were recruited in the early days of the Ho Chi Minh Trail by the first infiltrators. And the topography was very, very difficult. Once North Vietnamese troops crossed into the south, took up positions in the Asha Valley, began to lay siege to these small special forces bases that were there, trying to recruit the ethnic people. Um, the special forces base in Asha was overrun in March of 66. The North Vietnamese took control of the valley and they never lost it. It was essentially the most important place in the war, I argue in the book, um, because it was, it was the bastion of the North inside the South. And the terrain there was so difficult. The weather was always foul. It was always covered in cloud and fog and mist. The aerpl airplanes couldn't deal with it properly. The troops that were sent in to infiltrate it in small units usually got shot up. And, uh, they never recovered. The, the United States never recovered that valley. So Manus's first assignment 
was to provide security for a, a team of engineers who were building an access road that would give the US proximity to the Ashar Valley where they could establish long range artillery fire bases. That was his first assignment. It, absolutely this, critical importance that place throughout the war. This is to the west of Way, which will be- To the west of Way. And it's critical to the Tet Offensive in January of 68 because it this road that Manus was working to secure, that was the route of access. Um, and the first place he saw combat was on a hill, Hill 674, which was a secondary route of, of troop movements from the Ashar Valley to attack the city of Huey. And the city, it, it was an ancient historic city. It was the capital, symbolically the capital of Vietnam. Um, it was the site of the monarchy. It was the site of the old um, uh, ruling class, the French ruling class. And it was the main target of the Tet Offensive in, in i -Corps, was to seize the city of Hue. Meanwhile, we leave i -Corps, we go to Saigon, where Chuck Searcy, because he's an intelligence officer, sees the reports coming in about the war going badly, very badly. The casualty rates do not support the claim that every, America won every battle, which was a falsehood at the time, I, I understand, but these many decades later, it makes you wince, George. Uh, the life in Saigon was not in discontinuous with the very famous book, The Quiet American, friendly during the day and deadly at night. At one point, Chuck Searcy is invited to dinner at the edge of Saigon, and he travels with his friends to a family that greet him. However, the next day when he tells his commanding officer where he's been, how does he react, George, and what does it mean? Well, the commanding officer freaks out. <laughs> He says, show me exactly where you went. He takes Chuck over to a wall map of the city and Chuck tries to, re to retrace the steps he took uh, to the home of this cyclo driver, um, pedal rickshaw driver, uh, whose home he had visited. And the, the, com the, the commanding officer just was horrified. He said, this is like a hotbed of Vietnam, uh, of Viet Cong activity. It's on the Saigon River. They'd, they could have killed you and dumped you in the river which is, of course, what happens to the naive uh, American, the quiet American in Graham Greene's novel. But Chuck was motivated by a desire to get to know the Vietnamese. To, I mean, he'd grown up in segregation. The South Vietnamese and the Americans in the intelligence um, community didn't communicate with each other, they didn't socialize with each other, except you know, the Americans went after these very available and attractive young Vietnamese women but they didn't strike up friendships and Chuck wanted to do that. And then the reporting, you know, all of his colleagues really became disillusioned for very similar reasons to people at home, which was that the generals and the politicians were demanding uh, intelligence on the war they thought and hoped was being fought rather than the war that was actually being fought. And there was a constant incentive to misrepresent the reporting that was going up the chain to the generals, to put a rosy face on everything. And that became a very hard illusion to sustain. And even General Westmoreland, you know, he was recalled at the end of 67 as the Tet Offensive was approaching um, and troops were converging on the great Marine base of Quezon right on the DMZ. And Westmoreland wanted to say, look, President Johnson, Things are not going well here. And Johnson said, you are not gonna say that to the US public. You're gonna stand up and make a speech at the National Press Club. And you're gonna tell the American Republic that the end is in sight and the war is going well. And he did that. And Chuck and his colleagues knew it was simply a falsehood. Meanwhile, there are 5 million gallons. I'm following George's reporting, 5 million gallons, 66, 67, 68. Uh, in, uh, chiefly in i -Corps. that's where they were. The airfields to the mountains, to the terrain, to the rivers, to the lakes, to the aquaculture, to the people living there, five million gallons. We're going to turn now to the combat in i -Corps and to the Tet Offensive. The book is The Long Reckoning, A Story of War, Peace and Redemption in Vietnam. George Black is the author. It is 6768. 
We start with Manus Campbell, who is in Alpha Company, the 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. They are in the killing zone of several parts of the I-Corps. Uh, George has mentioned Hill 674. That story stays with Manus Campbell the rest of his life, is still with him, because of the arbitrariness of death. How so, George? What does that mean to Manus Campbell? The first big firefight was a classic. About 80% of all the military engagements in Vietnam were at the initiative of the Vietnamese, the North and the Viet Cong. And the primary tool they used was the ambush. They would set up killing zones. They would entice American patrols in. Uh, the Hill 674 was, in fact, the stronghold of the North Vietnamese military command for those two provinces we've been talking about, which they called the Tri Tien military district immediately south of the DMZ. So Manus's company, his whole battalion, was sent into combat against what they didn't know were some of the most tough elite units of the North Vietnamese army. And his platoon walked into an ambush. Classic, you know, they'd set up this triangle ambush. Ironically, that exact same month, part of what Chuck Searcy was doing in Saigon was writing a handbook for the intelligence command on different kinds of Viet Cong and North Vietnamese ambush techniques. Manus's company walked straight into one. He is called in to reinforce the platoon and he's immediately thrown into this horrific firefight where the bodies of, I mean, the stream on which it happened is quite literally running red with blood. He shoots and kills his first man. And throughout the various subsequent firefights and large scale engagements he went through, there were so many times where, you know, literally he would throw himself to the ground. Another guy would throw himself to the ground next to him with his foot up against Manus's head and the bullet would hit the other guy's foot. Or he would be ambushed at night. His company would be overrun by North Vietnamese regulars in the middle of the night. And his lieutenant would come running up. Manus had just dug himself a fighting hole. And the lieutenant would say, no, you take the next one, I'll take this one. And the minute he jumps in, a shell hits it or a grenade hits it and he's killed. And that was an experience that was so common. It had nothing to do with how good a soldier you were. It was the arbitrariness of survival and of death. And it's really the root of PTSD. It's not just the horror of combat, it's, it's survivor guilt. Why him, why not me? In Saigon, the Tet Offensive is underway. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese have managed to gather a huge arsenal, and they mean to overrun the Americans, the embassy and all the Americans. Uh, Chuck Searcy is awakened with his commanding officer making clear to everybody this is not a practice. The interpretation of Tet at the time was that it was a defeat for the North Vietnamese. They lost a great number of casualties. Never The Viet Cong never really recovered. But you make the excellent point, and I believe Mr. Searcy and Mr. Campbell agree with you, that that was the moment North Vietnam won because they lost the American public. Did, they, did Searcy and Campbell know that at the time, or was that something they learned subsequent, that the American public turned away at that moment? Chuck was aware of it. Definitely, because, you know, the young men who were serving in the 519th Military Intelligence Battalion, they were reading the same news reports from home that everyone else was reading. They knew that something had gone horribly wrong and they'd been asked to misrepresent how the war was going. I think if you were a combat Marine up in i in the mountains, Manus Campbell actually didn't get ironically. It was the one time Manus Campbell had a fairly quiet time. He was stationed at that point in the Contien base, another of the really famous names of the war, which was constantly under siege. It was right on the DMZ. It was essentially a very exposed lookout post and it was shelled and, and mortared constantly for months. And he was there during Tet and actually Tet bypassed Contien. Uh, they went to seize the city of Dong Ha nearby, which was a big Marine combat base on the border. And they were besieging uh, Khe San, which is about 30 miles away on, on the Lao border. So 
Manus, I don't think, was ever really aware of, of the political situation. The one thing he talks about a lot, which was toward the end of his tour, he was sitting on this mountaintop on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which his company had been ordered to attack and blow up this newly discovered portion of. And he hears the death, he hears about the death on Armed Forces Radio of Bobby Kennedy. And that's the moment Chuck experiences it in Saigon. Here's the same broadcast. Manus is sitting on this perilous, beautiful hilltop. Chuck is, is about to be demobilized in Saigon. And that's the moment, I think, when both of them say, oh, my God, what are we going back to? What's happened to the country? What has the war done to the country? That, of course, they, was June of 68. Yeah, they do leave May of 69. Uh, the flight out. Uh, uh, Manus Campbell has another year left. He goes to Lejeune and then he's in Europe. Uh, yeah. Drinking heavily, starts drinking heavily. Yeah. And Chuck Searcy goes to Germany and then very much likes Germany and the experience he's having. But he becomes uh, convinced that the anti-war uh, movement has credibility. And that will lead him to, un to join the Vietnam veterans against the war, which... When we come back, we're going to turn to the significance of the anti-war movement after Tet and what it means for the investigation of the of the damage left behind by the American bombers and especially the herbicides. George Black is the author. The Long Reckoning is the book, a story of war, peace, and redemption in Vietnam. The war is done for America, but not for those who served there nor for the Vietnamese people who live with the remains of the American bombing campaign, the American herbicide campaign, and the damage done to generations in Vietnam. At the same time, America enters into a period of political turmoil following the exit from Vietnam during the time of Richard Nixon's second administration, particularly there were events, the Vietnam veterans against the war, they were throwing medals on the steps of the Capitol. There were protests. There were some radical statements being made as well. Chuck Searcy, one of our protagonists, participates in that way. He's a very skilled communicator at the University of Georgia and in Washington. Manus Campbell, on the other hand, withdraws, is a wanderer, is restless. At the same time, there's an overarching story that explains a deal of America's confusion and hesitation about the war during this period, which George guides me to say is 1973, that's the Nixon administration, through the Carter administration, through the Reagan administration, into the first term of Bill Clinton. That is the story of missing in action, left behind, the MIA flag. George, I've, I've very carefully followed your reporting. And what we have here is a legend that never had credible evidence, but the search continued for living MIA, correct, George? What was the vision in the 70s and 80s that made this such a political obstacle to those who wanted to speak of the war? Well, I think the, the context for it was that America was traumatized by its first ever experience of losing a war. And I think there was even a great denial about using the word losing and a body of opinion that was pretty vociferous that the reason the war had been lost was that the troops had been stabbed in the back. That was the phrase by the media, by politicians, by faithless civilians. I mean, it's a it's a phenomenon that I think is still to some degree with us and has been uh, uh, at the root of a lot of extreme right wing politics to this day. Uh, you know, these concepts morphed eventually into the idea of the deep state and the fake news. And those voices were very powerful in this atmosphere of bitterness in which the veterans, quite rightly, not in my view, because they had been stabbed in the back by any means, they'd been given vast resources to fight the war. Uh, and it was probably an unwinnable war because the only alternative to fighting a war of attrition, which both sides were doing, and Westmoreland put this very clearly, he said it's either attrition or it's annihilation, which meant nuclear weapons. 
<clears throat> that was politically impossible. And I think for that reason, the war was essentially unwinnable. But the veterans were treated very badly. No one knew how to deal with them. They were traumatized. They were sick. The, the families didn't know how to communicate with them. They didn't know how to talk about what they'd been through. And they'd been defeated. And there were also questions not only about America's might, but about its virtue. This was a whole new situation to grapple with. And the MIAs and the supposed POWs became a sort of lightning rod issue for that bitterness and that sense of conspiracy theories. The, you know, the search for MIAs, I know the head of the League of Families who absolutely rightly says, you know, this is a moral humanitarian obligation. You lose your young men in combat. You have a moral obligation to try to find them and bring them home and bury them and restore them to their families. But a lot of that movement became hijacked by this idea that somewhere for some dark communist purpose deep in the jungles of Laos, there were these living prisoners who were being held for years for no one knew what reason, even a bargaining chip or just pure sadism. And it really took root among a lot of Hollywood celebrities, among a lot of extreme right wing politicians. And it still really defined US Vietnamese relations for well over a decade. Um, ironically, it was Reagan in his second term who began the process of normalization in a very preliminary way, because essentially the argument was, look, the hard line with Vietnam, where we won't deal with them in any way until they deal with our MR, which was a great irony of this war. You know, normally, like Germany and Japan, the terms of the post-war were set by the winners. And really, in Vietnam, the terms were set by the losers, because the MIA issue blocked any other conversation. Uh, but they realized around 87 that it wasn't bringing the prisoners home and it wasn't bringing the MIAs home. So they took a new approach, which was to engage with the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese understood it was their interests to be cooperative and things began to change, except for this one faction who insisted against all the evidence, congressional investigations repeatedly found there were no living prisoners. Uh, but it went on right through the 1992 presidential campaign in the campaign of Ross Perot, which arguably cost George H.W. Bush the presidency and ironically brought to power, brought to office somebody that the right wing veterans community hated, Bill, Bill Clinton, a draft dodger. Um, the, the numbers are there were total missing in action of American of military. 2,646, that's yeah. the number. 570, 591 were brought home by the Nixon administration. There were no additional living, missing in action, American military figures found to my reading. Is that correct, George? No additional. There was never any credible evidence found that any prisoners survived. What you had was this kind of industry in rumor making in, you know, this community of people, opportunists grew right. up in Thailand and Laos who were coming up with, you know, animal bones to prove they'd found graves, to come up with live sightings of people that never existed. Um, and it just kept this bitterness going. And in the meantime, a woman named Adelaide Borton, who was called Lady Borton for Adelaide, is visiting maternity hospitals and is in Vietnam seeing the deformed babies and the fetuses. This information is available, but it's not being discussed in Washington. And is that because of MIA? Because there was a refusal to deal with the rest of the damage of the war until MIA was answered? I wouldn't simplify it quite like that. I'd say there were a number of stages that the process of normalization had to go through. Um, it began with Vietnamese cooperation on finding MIAs. That removed that initial barrier. Once the Vietnamese had done that, then there was a small scale reciprocal humanitarian move, which was to offer them aid for prosthetics for the disabled, 
And that very quickly raised the question, well, why are all these people disabled? And a large part of the reason was they were stepping on unexploded American bombs. Once that happened, you know, that was a fairly easy step because you didn't have to argue about cause and effect. Somebody steps on a cluster bomb, has their leg blown off, there's no debate. Whereas with Agent Orange, the science of Agent Orange was and still is extremely complex and full of uncertainties. And you could not, you cannot prove in any individual case that a particular disease is associated causally. The American veterans had to fight for more than 15 years to be recognized. And a lot of the recognition, it wasn't based on hard definitive science. It was based on politics. It was based on guilt. It was based on the fact that they had a lot of moral authority and the country felt very badly uh, by the end of the 80s about how they'd been treated. And they got the Agent Orange Act. And it said, if you were in Vietnam in the years of the war, and you had one of a number of diseases, there would be a presumed association and you would be eligible for benefits. But the Vietnamese never got that association because when they talked about Agent Orange, it was construed as communist propaganda, lies, an attempted extortion. It raised the specter of corporate liability for the producers and they didn't get recognition for another decade. I'm speaking with George Black, the author of The Long Reckoning, A Story of War, Peace, and Redemption in Vietnam. It is 1994. Chuck Searcy comes back to Vietnam. He's an accomplished political actor. He is extremely thoughtful and careful. He's very well spoken. He meets the American community in and around Vietnam at this point, including Adelaide Borton, who has had experiences of the damage of Agent Orange or something like it for many years. However, what Chuck Searcy also sees is what George Black, the author of the book, has just identified, the damage done by unexploded ordnance. An enormous amount of bombs have been dropped over Vietnam, chiefly in one place, i and along the coast, although there are other places where cluster bombs were used, and in Laos. And always to remember, Laos was also a target zone of the bombing and the herbicides. Chuck Searcy sees something he can do, but it's a mixed picture right now until Bill Clinton and his administration open a door with diplomatic relations. It's going to happen in 95. Was it a near thing, George, for the Clinton administration to open that door? Oh, yeah, very much so. There was still a furious opposition to normalization in Congress. And really at that point, and I think this makes an important point about bipartisanship. The move to normalize relations depended to a very large extent to veterans in the Senate who had credibility of both parties. And the two key figures in this were, well, three key figures. Uh, one was um, John Kerry, who of course was the most famous of the anti-war political leaders. The second one was John McCain, who had immense authority as a former prisoner of war who had been tortured in the famous Hanoi Hilton prison. And the third was Pete Peterson, who was another pilot who had been imprisoned in Hanoi, who was sent as the first ambassador. And that gave Bill Clinton a huge amount of necessary political cover, which allowed the process to proceed. But it was very fraught, 94, 95, it was on a knife edge. UXO first, the unexplained ordinance. Uh, Chuck Searcy sees it as something he can do, and eventually he will be putting together something he calls the Renew Project, which is a lengthy, which is an acronym. He also meets Charles Bailey for the Ford Foundation in Hanoi, in Vietnam, and they come together with a man named Jan Scruggs, who's earned by the year 2000 a great fortune in E-Trade, and helps Chuck Searcy put together his ongoing, uh, ongoing organization to help people who've been damaged by the bombing. This is all happening at once. But again and again, I think I say correctly, the American ambassador, the, the Clinton administration, even Chuck Searcy and the Ford Foundation were reluctant to get involved in the herbicide story. Is that correct, George? Everybody hung back from that because of the controversies. 
Yeah, there's a lot going on in that question. Let me just correct one thing. Jan Scruggs was the uh, veteran who came up with the idea of the Vietnam Wall and the Vietnam Memorial Fund in, in Washington. It was a colleague, um, Christos Kotsakos, who was another veteran who had fought in i who made the fortune in E-Trade and used some of that money to start up Project Renew. But what I would say all of these people had in common, including Cersei, including Charles Bailey of the Ford Foundation, including Lady Borton, they didn't come in and say to the Vietnamese, here are these solutions to your problems, which we've cooked up in America. They came in with a common question, which is, what do you need and how can we help? And in every case, what they did was driven by the guidance, the cooperation they had with their Vietnamese partners. You know, Chuck Cersei did not found Project Renew. He worked with a local Vietnamese official, a very charismatic and very smart young man whom I met in Quang Tri um, called Huang Nam to start this project. Everything Lady Borton did was guided by the circle of Vietnamese friends and colleagues that she developed. Charles Bailey, who came from the Ford Foundation, was not initially looking at Agent Orange. That wasn't the kind of thing the Ford Foundation did, but he was given a very broad mandate. His boss basically said, you'll figure out what to do when you get there. And one day he was, he was an agricultural specialist. And uh, he basically was looking for improved farming techniques to address poverty. And he was taken to this area one day by some local um, scientists to an area of the Central Highlands. And he said, why are all these hillsides naked from erosion? Where are the forests? And his host said, well, they were defoliated. <clears throat> so from that moment, he basically said, so what do you need? And they said, aid to the disabled and aid to restore the landscapes that were destroyed. And that became a huge part of his work from 97 onwards. We introduce now a Canadian, Chris Hatfield and his <clears throat> Hatfield Associates, working very carefully, but uh, almost in uh, feeling their way in an unknown landscape about the herbicides and about the damage done to the triple canopy jungle, to the water, to the fields and to the people. Very carefully, they approach this by asking for studies by taking, eventually they get blood samples, but everybody's reluctant, not just the Americans, but also the Vietnamese. Why, was, uh, why were the leadership in Hanoi, why were they reluctant to embrace what Chris Hatfield was doing uh, to urge people to participate in these studies? Well, I think that generalizes a little bit. I think there were two schools of thought. You know, the, the economic reformers in Vietnam knew how fraught the issue of Agent Orange was for the Americans, and they steered clear of it. The medical community and the military community particularly really knew how serious the problem was and were very angered by the fact that their scientists were being dismissed as propagandists. I, there's one section of the book that I have always thought was one of the most important sections, uh, which discusses the work of the first generation of Vietnamese wartime and post-war scientists. To see these people written off as propagandists and extortionists is absurd. These were world-class scientists. Uh, the, the leader of the group, Dr. Tong Tat Tung, is publishing articles about liver disease in the Lancet, you know, the great medical journal in Britain on liver disease. And Let's the tell the story, George. We'll tell the story when we come back. George okay. Black, we're going to now address the revelations of the herbicides. The book is The Long Reckoning, a story of war, peace, and redemption in Vietnam. It is now the 1990s and the early 2000s, this period between the talk of recognition, diplomatic rec recognition between the U.S. and between Washington and Hanoi started in 94, was capped in 95 with the Clinton administration. But between there and 2006, as my note, there was a frozen period where everybody had issues, personal issues, political issues, financial issues, to hang back from the full understanding of what 
Agent Orange, Agent Purple, Agent White, the herbicides, not only had done to the landscape and the people, but we're doing to the next generation and perhaps more than that. George, beg pardon for, inter for interfering in your explanation. It was the Vietnamese research that fixed the dioxin as the poison, as the poison we, TCDD. Uh, but the Hatfield organization is also coming in, a Canadian, to give us information that points to TCDD as well. But there still was reluctance, and you were explaining why. Please continue, George. Yeah, the, uh, I was talking about the connection to liver disease. The first patterns of disease that struck the North, the, the doctors and scientists in the North were returning veterans and even veterans in the field on the Ho Chi Minh Trail where one of these doctors operated a field hospital. They're seeing all these cases of liver cancer in, in young men in their twenties and they can't understand it. And then they're coming back to Hanoi or to the North after the war and they're giving, their wives are giving birth to these grossly deformed babies, kids with terrible birth defects. And they want to understand the phenomenon. Chris Hatfield and his team <clears throat> arrived with the same question as the others. What do you need? What can we do to help? And the government had a committee at that point staffed by these scientists I'm talking about called the 1080 Committee. And the 1080 committee says what we need is a really comprehensive study in an area that was heavily sprayed that can really give a soup to nuts picture of how this worked. And the problem is dioxin comes from many different sources. It comes from cement factories. It comes from urban incinerators. You had to find a place that was pristine from a, from a totally non-industrialized point of view. And by an interesting turn of history, the place that the Vietnamese scientists took Hatfield to was the famous Ashaw Valley, which was so bitterly important to the war itself. There had never been any industrial development. It was a totally peasant indigenous community. It had terrible levels of birth defects and there were no other conceivable sources. So if you found dioxin, you knew it was from Agent Orange. <clears throat> and that gave rise to the idea of the hot spot, that the concentration, people were partly deterred by the idea that the whole country had been sprayed. So how did you begin to get a handle on the problem? And a lot of people saying, well, like is every inch of farmland and forest land still contaminated? And Hatfield set out to map the journey of dioxin from the airplanes into the soil, into the water, into the body, and they found that basically most of the agricultural and forest land was pretty clean. Dioxin had degraded through natural processes, but where it concentrated was in food, particularly the fatty tissue of fish, um, ducks, and other creatures that absorbed the dioxin into their fat, passed it on to humans. And then really the worst tragedy of the whole dioxin story to me is that breast milk has an extremely heavy fat content. It's what makes it so nutritious. It's the most nutritious thing in the world. And women were expelling dioxin through their breast milk into their babies. So Hatfield's report with the 1080 committee, and it was a joint report. It was not a Canadian report. It was financed by the Ford Foundation because they had the kind of resources and influence that the Vietnamese themselves didn't have. Hatfield produced its report in 2000, presented it to the US ambassador, Pete Peterson. And he basically said, you guys have given me a really big political problem here because the truth could no longer be evaded. Even then, even then, it took another six years before the first aid went in to deal with the problem. It is now the Bush administration there is recognition that herbicides are a lingering threat, uh, but what is to be done? How do you track where they are and what is to be, uh, and how do we mitigate them? Along comes a hero. Uh, I take it a former infantryman, Michael Kelly, who must be the world's uh, a living AI because he tracks all 2,735 installations. What is that? How does that help, George? 
Well, it comes out of what Hatfield's chief scientist called the hotspot theory. Most of the dioxin, the worst dioxin in the Ashaw Valley was around the old special forces base we talked about earlier, which had been destroyed in 1966. And there had been massive aerial spraying. There had also been massive perimeter spraying of the base to clear the brush. And when the base was overrun, the barrels that were stored there had been smashed and leaked into the ground. And Wayne Dwernichuk, the lead scientist said, the problem is not everywhere. It's in very localized hotspots of old military bases. And that means you can deal with it. So the next thing was, well, which military bases? Because as you say, there were more than 2,700. <clears throat> and they isolated the problem essentially not surprisingly, in a way, to the big air bases that had been the centers of the herbicide campaign, because the main problem came from storage and leakage and uh, faulty barrels and thousands of gallons just going into the soil in and around the air bases, which were in major urban areas. Uh, da Nang was one, and that controlled the herbicide campaign in Laos and in i -Corps. And then Benhua, which is 20 miles outside Saigon, which was the center of operations for the South and the biggest of all the bases. Uh, yes, and I also noted there's uh, there was problems at Tan San Hut. Is that the, that's the air, air base in Saigon? Yeah, Tan San Yut was the original center of operation Ranch Hand. It's now the international airport. There is a lingering mystery um, of whether there was a serious concentration of dioxin anywhere at Tan Son Yut. <clears throat> but being the uh, international airport, it's always been too hot a potato. It's all been paved over. It's all industrial area now. We'll never know. But that suspicion lingers. But yeah, Da Nang and Ben Hua were the two proven big ones where Hatfield and the 1080 committee did extensive field investigations and found horrific horrific levels of dioxin in the soil, the water, the fish. Both air bases included lakes that local people used to fish and sell fish to the markets. So it was getting into the civilian population that way. I want to understand what it means to have a half-life as a dioxin, because it's different for water, it's different for the canopy, it's different for human beings, it's different for fish. What is half-life refer to? Is that the time you're still threatened or you can pass it? Yeah, over? I mean, basically not to get into the scientific complexity, but yeah, it's it's the, the breakdown of the toxic substance and how long it remains a danger. We apply it also to, to nuclear materials. And yeah, it's in the open air, it degrades very, very quickly through the effect of sunlight. In soil, in the topsoil, it's exposed sooner. You go deeper into the ground, it lasts longer. You go into the water, into the sediment at the bottom of the water, and it lasts even longer. And there are different standards for what concentrations are safe in different kinds of soils. Um, so that was its persistence in the human body is really the issue. And it persists in tissue and is passed down through the generations and lasts for a good number of years in the human body. And like I say, the only way of expelling it from the human body is through breast milk. We've spoken of i uh, almost entirely, although it's, uh, other parts of the country are exposed. But it's important to add something here that was never part of the conversation in the U.S., although it started in Laos. The trouble started in Laos. It's that the the border of the Laotian border with Vietnam was heavily overrun by the aircraft, the C-130s and the C-123s that would come in the morning and spread the mist. And I believe, help me, George, I believe it's a young woman named Susan Hammond, who with her colleagues has the very good idea to investigate Laos, that side of the border, especially the flight pass of the aircraft. Do I say that yeah. correct? Yeah. Um... Susan is an interesting character in the book. She comes into the story later <clears throat> because of her work on Laos. As I said earlier, the spraying of Laos was one of the deepest, deepest secrets of the war. And not even the Lao government was kept informed, really, of what was going on on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Susan was the daughter of, is the daughter of a veteran, a lieutenant colonel, who served in I-Corps 
and passed away as a result of Parkinson's disease, which is one of the um, diseases associated with Agent Orange exposure. And she and a colleague, Jackie Chagnon, who had worked with her husband, Roger Rumpf, who was a theologian, uh, they had worked for many years in Laos after the war doing humanitarian relief work for a Quaker associated organization. And the, Jackie knew anecdotally from traveling in these very remote mountain areas that there were problems there too with deformed babies with high levels of disabilities. <laughs> and Susan set out to map the problem with Jackie. Now, what is interesting and how it relates to uh, what was done at the same time or earlier in Vietnam is that dealing with the problem of dioxin took two tracks. Cleaning up the air bases at Da Nang and Bien Hoa was much more expensive, but it was a technological challenge. And once you overcome the political resistance, it's expensive, but it's, you know, it's doable. And it, it was less of a hurdle than getting direct aid to the people with disabilities. And that brought in really critically important support from politicians, particularly the recently retired Senator from Vermont, Patrick Leahy, and his aide, Tim Reeser, who is a legend in Washington, also just retired. And they said, we've got to turn this into policy. They worked with Charles Bailey, they worked with the scientists, they worked with Susan Hammond and Chuck Searcy, they finally got the first humanitarian aid to Vietnamese victims. And Susan went to Tim Reeser and said, we think we've got a problem in Laos too. We wanna to just investigate it. So they did, they set about doing a survey and they came back. And I originally published this story in the New York Times Magazine a couple of years ago. They proved there were patterns of disabilities. They had the data on which areas had been sprayed they found that it was in the sprayed villages where the main problem existed. And for the first time last year, just last year, Tim Reeser pushed through the Congress, the first ever humanitarian aid program for, the, for, for Lao victims of Agent Orange. The book is The Long Reckoning, a story of war, peace and redemption in Vietnam. George Black is the author. What I learned importantly is that the story is not closed. It remains a challenge, a work in progress. But a meeting in 2019 in Vietnam, I have the US ambassador, Kristen Bach, Charles Bailey of the Ford Foundation, uh, Tim Reeser, who uh, George just mentioned, Pat Leahy was there, Chuck Searcy was there, others gathering at an airfield to begin a project 2019 that the then Secretary of Defense, Mr. Mattis said, would begin to deal with the ghosts of the past. Question is, is it adequate, George, today? But I, because I want to go to a story you tell of a young woman named uh, Yen, I believe her name is. Yeah. Who yeah. goes home to her family. She's disabled in some fashion, and she's never flown on a plane, but she makes her way in the world in the big cities. And she goes home to her family to visit for the first time, I take it, in several years. And there's a sense of superstition and rejection and a plain horror that comes to these families because they're, they're not entirely certain that it was the Americans that did it. What do they think? That it was bad ghosts or something like that, George? Well, Yen is from one of the indigenous peoples I mentioned earlier, whose story I think needs to be told in full. She's from the Taoi people. And their belief system is that the world is ruled by spirit forces who are present in every landscape, in trees, in rivers, in animals. And birth defects are held to be the work of angry spirits. And Yen's mother, whom I met when we went back to her village, um, Yen's mother wanted her to be killed at birth. She only survived because of the intercession of her grandparents. She was very, very badly deformed by a disease called arthrogryposis, which is a distortion of the lower limbs or, or all four limbs in her case. Um, and she's just a person of immense spirit and determination, extraordinary young woman. And she exemplifies what Charles Bailey has long argued, which is it doesn't take many material resources to 
radically improve the lives of these people and a lot more resources are needed. And it shouldn't be a partisan matter. This meeting at the Bienhua Air Base, Patrick Leahy was leading a Senate delegation. It was a bipartisan delegation. Uh, Lisa Murkowski was on it, Eric Portman, a third Republican whose name escapes me at the moment. But it was, this is not a partisan issue. Some of the people who are doing humanitarian aid and relief work are conservative evangelicals, um, are Trump supporters working with anti-war activists because it's a humanitarian issue. It shouldn't be politicized. But uh, Charles's message is give a little aid to these people and you can transform their lives. You can open up the kind of potential that someone with Yen Li's determination can sort of battle through on their own. Susan Hammond tells a story that I think is a wonderful example. She has a program also in villages uh, in the hinterland near Da Nang in the old I Corps. And she went to a house one day and found a man who was of a certain age now, very badly disabled in his lower limbs. He's a bicycle repairman. And it's increasingly difficult for him to sit on the ground to work on his bicycles. She says, what do you need? He says, a red plastic stool. One of those little, <laughs> she said, what do you mean a red plastic stool? He said, that's what I need. It would, it would change my life. So she goes to the market. She buys a red plastic stool. It costs $2. Man's life has changed. You know, $1,000 can transform the life of these families who in many cases now uh, especially a lot of families I know in Kwang Tri province, the parents are getting old. They have kids who are severely disabled, who are approaching middle age. And the parents are terrified they're going to die first and who's going to look after their kids. And a thousand dollars will work miracles for a family like that in a poor area. So that's un unfinished business. There are many other parts of unfinished business, but that's one where a small amount of resources with bipartisan support. This is what Charles Bailey in congressional terms calls decimal dust. This is a nothing in, in congressional appropriations budgets. Our protagonist, Manus Campbell, he's, li he's living in Vietnam. He's remarried, I believe, to a Vietnamese woman, but he moves around so much. I'm not sure what city he's in, George. Where is he now? Well, he's now in one of the main tourist centers, although he tries to live away from the crowds, Hoi An, which is a gorgeous old uh, Chinese seaport um, on the coast just south of Da Nang. He lived in Hanoi for a while. He lived in Hue originally, was driven out by the bad weather. He had pneumonia a couple of times, uh, moved to Hanoi, and now he's moved to um, Hoi An. And, Chuck's and yes, he moved. He, I met his wife in November when I was last there for the first time. Absolutely lovely, delightful Vietnamese woman. He has an adopted son and uh, he's found his own kind of personal redemption after these many years of wandering uh, and, and psychological and spiritual torment. He's become a follower of the great Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat right. Hanh. And he's found his own form of redemption. And he works with kids in orphanages and local projects and gives a lot of his own income to that. And Chuck Searcy is planning to go home to Athens. Has he gone yet? To Chuck Athens? and I, I actually went to Athens with Chuck a couple of weeks ago. Okay. He came back uh, for personal reasons. A friend who had been a long-term renter of the house Chuck still owns in Athens uh, was seriously ill. Chuck came over. Uh, the friend passed away, and Chuck has remained simply now to sell his house right. in Athens. He still has deep roots in Georgia. It was a wonderful visit with him, met a lot of his old friends from college. The book is The Long Reckoning, A Story of War, Peace, and Redemption in Vietnam. George Black is the author. I'm John Batchelor.